Good. So I'll introduce uh, Abby Hussein from, uh, from Wielder District Council. Thank you for saying. Usually, I usually get a crowd of three, but thank you for saying so. I've got more than three this time. <laughs> Generally, just a picture of what is happening in Wielder. Obviously, it's not time, and I'm sure everybody in this room can relate to and feel poverty, the rising prices in fuel bills, the hard to treat homes, the hard to heat homes, and the ones where you're living and you're actually turning it off rather than keeping it on because you think that you're going to save money, obviously, because you can't afford to pay that amount of money that they're asking for. In Wielden alone, there's about around 3,300 properties in class in fuel poverty. That's where they're spending more of their income on paying their utility bills and foregoing things like the kids need to eat, or I will eat, or feed my kids, etc. There's different pictures, obviously, there's different indicators, rural uh, and urban deprivation. I tend to say to myself, rural is more prone to fuel poverty than urban. Because urban, you've got more properties on gas, therefore they can obviously use gas central heating systems. Rural are all uh, probably electric storage eaters, nightmare to use them, um, electric, normal electric convector eaters, and oil-fired systems, which are expensive to run, and obviously um, you know why. When every winter they tend to put it up from 56 pence a litre to something like 85 pence a litre. The number of hard to treat properties we have are obviously all there because they're rural, they're all of different distinctions, they're not all the same property type like you would in a row of terrace houses, we've got different varied degrees of four or five bedroom houses down to one bedroom bungalows. And obviously we've got the impact of the energy prices and the credit crunch since the summer 2008. Um, and in treating this obviously type of fuel poverty it doesn't always improve the environmental aspect of that building. It's all about the education on the interior of the person that's actually living there. These are echo improvements, which I'm not going to go into detail, much detail about, but these are like what they call the Home Energy Conservation Act, which basically gives us an indicator of what's going on out, out in, the, in Wielden. They do it annually, we obviously do it um, specific to Wielden, and it's seen a sharp increase up to 2006, 2007, and then 2000, 2008, it's still a slight drop, but not much. So you've got roughly over 4.5 million people in, in fuel poverty in this country. And that's just in the UK, in England alone. That doesn't include Wales and Scotland. No, I think I've got the wrong slide up here. <laughs> there were three presentations on your yes. thing, and she never asked you which one. Is this the wrong one? <laughs> It is. It should be the NEA, NEA fuel poverty. Yeah, yes, it is. Yes, it is. The wrong one is, what, is that what you mean? Yeah, I think it's, it's all, at the beginning it's all about Ersman, 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 some Ersman Sue information. I put that one up. Is that the one, yeah? Yeah, it must be that one. That one. <laughs> Sorry about that, it's just yeah. me. I've got that many of them there. Right, okay. Current issues. The delays in the energy supply funding schemes due to a huge uptake in winter energy savings trust schemes and all. The energy savings trust being uh, like the warm front schemes where you used to get upgrades to boiler system, heating systems. They changed the criteria this year so that um, more people or less people could access that funding. They dropped the funding from £400 million to £110 million. Therefore people who apply for warm front funding for upgrades to heating systems and boilers, etc., can't access that because the criteria for that and the access is so strict. The uncertainty in energy supply funding for next year will change because at the end of at the end of this of 2012, we changed from what we call the CERT fund CES fund, which is utility money, to something called the ECO, which is a good sounding name, but it actually means energy company obligation. <laughs> So it's their obligation to actually put money into the fuel poor households to get those properties to an affordable warmth level. Energy efficiency schemes, well you've got the energy customer which is a cert like I spoke about in the CES, the CES means carbon energy um, reduction schemes which means they only go to deprived areas. Now that's one thing that I have a bit of a hula about because they say that in indices of deprivation Wielden doesn't have any areas that are in de deprived areas, i.e. Wielden, everybody in Wielden and everybody in the southeast is all rich. 
you're all rich and you're all living in this grandiose lifestyle and you're all warm in your buildings. There are two places in, in East, in, well, one place in East Sussex and one place in West Sussex that have got a, an area, what they call an indices of deprivation. That's Hastings and Brighton, part of Brighton. That's where all the money was going last year. Millions and millions of pounds for funding. So we, in the middle of Robert Lewis and if the Weald and, and Eastbourne, we're not getting any of that money. And there was there were literally more than a billion pounds of money that went elsewhere in this country because of the indices of deprivation. Or somebody up there says, you are not in a deprived area, you don't get any funding. The CERT funding is usually the cavity wall loft insulation, the draft excluded stuff. So basically, to me, that's peanut money. You know, it's not enough to sort of say, we want to take a property and make it affordably warm so people in there can live there and have their fuel bills lowered by 40%. That, that's not right. The taxpayer, obviously, we all paid for the warm front. Everybody pays for the, low, the, warm, the warm front payments. Why do you pay for it? Because you pay for it on a levy on your fuel bill. The more funding you get from a utility company, the more likely they're going to put the price up on the electric and gas because that pays for the actual funding. So in the, in the, what, something called the Green Deal comes out next year, but that's a totally different aspect of things. That will take care of all this confusion and all this tomfoolery with money saying, cert says, one front, no, it'll all go. We'll have one fixed mechanism. Being, being listed as the 18th wealthiest village in the country didn't help Forest Road's It doesn't. Very much. Yeah. There was a, a recent poll they'd done, and it was based on the number of houses over a million pounds that were sold, and we came number 18 in the whole country. Yeah, that exactly that <laughs> de de determines whether or not funding comes into this, this, this region. That is exactly what it is. It's like, for instance, Leicester being classed as an area of deprivation. I know Leicester from old and he's not deprived. Liverpool, Leeds, Hull, down into sort of like Leicester, Nottingham, and across to sort of like the likes of Bristol and stuff. The money that has been poured into there is obscene because the amount of money that they get to do projects, take all streets, all communities, and change all that, retrofit them, and obviously, like the person before talks about the green stuff, they would just literally put external wall insulation on old properties within, say, Bootle in Liverpool, hundreds and hundreds of houses at a cost of millions. For what? For what intent? It doesn't do, any, it doesn't do anything for that property. It's not about the property, it's about who's in it. They put the, put the affordable law factor there, the person in it starts then cranking up the eating systems. Or says, oh, we're saving £100 a month, let's go on holiday and burn the carbon on an airplane. Yeah, but we might do that in Forest Road, we didn't have all these rich houses. I think in, for, I think, I think in certain areas, in Forest Road, I always, I always say Forest Road is one of the, one of the places in Wheeland that gets, gets um, forgotten. So when I, when I took this jump and I looked at the areas that have been saturated with help and, and obviously advice, etc., spoke to Anna, said, right, I'll come up here to Forest Road. Well, you're a transition town, so we'll work with you. And any supplier or any utility company that says to us, we've got funding to do eco-friendly things for schools or community, we'll take that and we'll put it into this area. So we've come to, uh, to the transition town can be what it wants to be. Forget Polgate, forget Kroger, forget Edge and forget Oakfield and Eafield. Let's look at someone that's not had any help, not had any sort of focus on, which is Forest Road, a lovely place. And people, that is why the perception is that, you know, you all walk right around in Range Rovers and uh, ride horses on the weekend, but you don't, do you? I <laughs> what <laughs> do. Oh, okay. um, so, cost of insulating materials for wheeling, loft insulation out of the 44,500 dwellings at an average cost of £199 is £8,855,500, that's what it's cost. Cavity wall insulation, 30,000 dwellings at £199, an average of five, £5 million, nearly £6 million. Pounds. It's been discounted down, but lots of the discounts that have been applied to that, um, a company comes in and says we'll do it for £149. That £149 is theirs. They still get the same. They still get the, the actual amount of money to actually do your property. They get paid for that. They will always do a virgin loft because they get paid the full amount of money. For example, doing one loft that is a virgin loft, they get four hundred pounds per property. To do a loft where they do a top up, they get forty pounds. So which one would they rather do? So they'll come to your property and say, "I'm not going to do it. You've got adequate insulation. No, you haven't. You need two hundred and seventy mil." 
to make it adequate, to keep that heat in. If you don't have that, then you, you still lose heat. But they'll say to you, no, no, you've got adequate. And the reason why is that is, is because of the balance of money that they actually receive. Referral, the current referral method, East Sussex Energy Partnership. I have put the wrong slide, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, I'll go with this one. Um, HCL Energy, Energy Savings Trust, which has changed now, energy, energy supply schemes. You used to get boilers in one front, you can't get boilers anymore. Renewables, East Sussex Energy Partnership, that used to be, it's been resurrected, that's all the councils in East Sussex coming together, trying to get funding for everybody. But obviously, um, that's an hard task, getting that out of the government at the moment in time. Three schemes. Obviously, we've done your funding from a range of sources, but include contributions from the council. That, that is another thing that can't be done because of the cuts. Um, and how do we pay for £14 million pounds of insulation in Wheeldon? Because there's still a lot of houses out there that need doing. Not lost in capital. The houses that need doing are the ones that are unusual type, which is like external wall insulation. The, um, the 500 year old building, you know, the, the ones that need internal wall insulation because the council planning won't allow you to change the front of the building or the outlook of that building. Then we'd need some large income generation. Next year there will be different mechanisms in place that suit the person's property rather than suit their pockets. The, obviously we have had examples of Chichester getting loan schemes where you get up to £4,000. But people can't take loans on anymore. They can't afford it. There's the, a the, the fine line between that. South Glo Gloucestershire tried it with an interest of 3%, put people in debt. Because the loans, obviously, when they want the loan money back, they're asking for it, people can't afford it. And obviously, you still require substantial investment because you've obviously got to pay for 50% of it doing. They're not going to give you nothing for nothing. They're going to say, well, yeah, you can have, say, solar panels on your roof, but it's going to cost you 10 grand. Yeah, you can have a new boiler, but you'll have to put two grand towards it. It's a no-brainer, really. They're not actually helping you. It's just still keeping people in fuel poverty. That's the end of that one, but I'll carry on. <laughs> can I just um, change it to this one? I've got, I've got time. Uh, yeah. Here's one I prepared earlier. Okay. <laughs> If you have any questions about that, then just let me know. I mean, I know it's, it's, it's quite intense on certain things, on statistics and stuff like that. But being, talking in layman's terms, if we are to drive fuel poverty down, we make homes affordably warm by doing the basics, by looking at the fabric of the building. Not the PV on the roof, not the biomass boilers, not the solar thermal or the air source heat pumps and stuff like that. Oh yeah, they're all attractive to have, and they're all really nice to have. But the basics of a building, the fabric of that building, i.e. the walls, the roof, and the floor, you make them, what, obviously you make them in, like thermally efficient, so there's no thermal, what they call a thermal break, the heat doesn't go out of them. You make them like that, then educate the people inside, the lifestyles that they hold. You will always win reducing fuel poverty. You, you might not eradicate it, but you reduce it substantially. Um, I'm interested really what, what really how much difference one can make to old houses without cavity walls, with limited ability to double glaze, with limited ability to deal with solid floors, for example, yeah. without digging everything up. I read a statistic the other day in the newspaper that uh, energy costs in the, to, the re, to the user in this country are 30% uh, lower than they are in much of Europe, for example yeah, Sweden. Yeah. Yet the average Swedish house uses 50% less power mm -hmm. for a lot more warmth, a lot more quality of life. I, I can relate to that, yeah. So really, does, is there any benef real benefit to be gained when the power companies are putting the price up 30% per year? If, we, if you took the Sweden situation, my son lives in Sweden. Which is the one you're um, I think it's the one again when it says any year. Somewhere down there. Right, so it's probably now going down. Yeah, going back to that about 
my son lives in Sweden and I've just come back, I went out there in September, yeah? Um, and they've got, uh, they live in a village and in that village they have a wood timber plant. And rather than say, well, we use the timber and whatever we've got left we throw away, that plant decided to take that into a combined heating power source. So they use the old, the old pieces of wood and any extras and they use that to eat hot water that they send all the way around the village. So whereas you, you actually sit in, in his property in the cold, you're not cold, the, the heat's there, it's ambient temperature all the time. Yeah, it is expensive to live there, I mean, what, a loaf of bed costs about a fiver, something like that. But, yeah, they've got it right on the eating systems, the solar power farms that are just outside Stockholm that supply electricity to in, the interior. The, the, they've got that right. The problem with us in England we don't embrace that. We've, I mean, I'll be totally honest, 30 years later, we start putting up PV panels. We also have this uh, ridiculous uh, attraction or sentimental view of our housing stock, yeah. which is probably the worst in Europe. But with a little bit of, a little bit of um, education and, and a small amount of investment, mm -hmm. you could actually make your property more warm, uh, affordable warmth in there than somebody that goes out and puts air source heat pumps and cavity and loft insulation. Because you can use certain certain techniques going back to the old, it's like we just said to that gentleman before. In 1949 in, in Liverpool, in a street of houses were built that were all carbon zero. They demolished them all to make way for new properties. So it's like things like that. We, you're right in what you say, we don't embrace it. We need to look at other ways of actually in, enhancing the properties we live in. For, you know, we could put renewable technology in there because it's all incentivised. But, uh, I, you know, I go a 500-year-old listed property with windows that can't have secondary double glazing in, why not use window film? You can get thermal film now for windows. Um, the people who make magnetic tapes, um, was it BMF or whatever it is, they make that, you could put that on your windows. Planning permission would be granted because it's not changing the appearance of the windows. You can get different colours and shades. For walls, you can get tempered which is internal light wallpaper. It's just like a wall, you just put it up and you paint it and it looks like you can literally have it looking like a normal wall, like that. So there's little, little things that are less expensive that can be done, but we don't embrace that, like you say. Going back to the fuel poverty bit, now we've got the right slide. Oh, I've got enough time. Um, a few minutes. A few minutes, right? Four minutes. I'll just go through this bit there. Average price, average price increase. Gas since 2003, 146%. Electricity, 98%. That's never going to stop going up, that's going to keep going. Gas, although they make billions of pounds profit, will still keep going up. They, they blame the fact that we don't have enough gas in the North Sea, we do. They've just found new gas, but it's too expensive to drill for. So basically the import of that, it comes from Russia. A nice little pipeline that comes through Amsterdam and comes out at Bacton in uh, Norfolk. And there's a one further up that comes out in Newcastle that pumps gas into this country. Um, combined gas bill. In January 2003 was £572. What is it now? Oil and electricity, above for nearly 1400 quid. So that's never going to change. Numbers in fuel poverty keep rising. Over 5 million from in 1996, but it drops and then it goes back. It's starting to creep up again in 2009. We're nearly 4 million people in fuel poverty, and that's across the country. Is that directly linked to the price of... That's directly linked to, as soon as, as soon as they put the price up, we will see, for instance, from now until 2013, we will see another 600,000 children in households in fuel poverty because of the price rises. That is what we will get in 2013. Mm -hmm. Obviously, income, de income defined, in the South East, obviously, we say that we are 17% of properties are in fuel poverty. The indicator for annual, for general, is 10% of people in fuel poverty in the UK. But in Wealdon alone, it's 13%. We've got more people in fuel poverty because of the rural aspects yeah. of things. Mm -hmm. I just want to get well, to it's this. It's like they've got 16% for London, but that... Yeah, you know, but then a the portion now, but if you look at yeah. what we've got in... You know, we are, we are the fifth worst um, area, region, in the UK because of fuel poverty. We are fifth. That's why we're doing a lot of work on fuel poverty this coming year. Examples are here. You, you look at Ersman Sioux, people say Ersman Sioux, lovely place. Okay. People in those houses are all, you know, yep. nicely, not nicely off, but they're, they're not, not under poor. 26.5% are in fuel poverty in that area. And these areas, this surprised me when we did the, did the work to find these out, like five ashes crossing hand. 
Plot and East Oathley, Halland, Windmill Hill, Walton, all these places are places you wouldn't think were in field poverty. But they are. And it's the houses they live in. It's not, it's not because they can't afford to Sorry, I'm not saying it's not because they, they can afford to pay, it's the houses they're living in are just leaking heat and it's harder to actually keep those properties warm. So what about, what, where would Forest Row appear on that? Forest Row would probably be in the region of about 20 to 21 percent. Oh, so only just below that? Yeah, just below it, yeah. I mean, I, I did look at Forest Row and this is about 21 percent, which is still too high. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is high and it's, it's probably because, once again, it's the makeup of the buildings yeah. that we've got. Hard to treat properties obviously are the ones like that, like the rural aspect of things. Um, they're doing a lot of work in a city on these properties. You know, you see the cladding going on the, on the high rise and you see the, the tourist houses being totally made, having a makeover and they're doing all that for them, but they tend to forget these properties, the ones that we live in. A bit about indoor temperature and health, I'm not going to dwell on that, everybody knows that it should be above 18% to stop adverse health effects. Below 9 degrees, deep body temperature falls, obviously, ideal room temperatures. It's interesting, last year, um, more, uh, the actual winter mortality rate in Wealdon was 81 people dying from cold-related deaths. So in the, the year before, last year, we went up to 146. So it's going back up again. We thought it was falling, it's now, we, after we've identified it, it's going back up. So what will it, what will it hold this year, for the, if we're predicting to have a really cold snap? So, so there, fuel debt, and your inadequate eating, maintenance problems, health and well-being, heart attack, strokes, all those types of things, asthma, worsening arthritis, and mental well-being. Just one of the things at the bottom is say mental well-being. People don't relate to that, I think everybody's walking around a bit doolally and screaming at the sun sort of thing, it's not the case. <laughs> Mental well-being there is the stress that that puts you under. The amount of stress that it puts you under you, you don't know where to turn. And obviously you need advice, one of the things is get advice, talk to people, don't be afraid to say, well, from whatever walk of life you come from, talk to people and say, look, I need, I need some advice that will help me get this stress off my shoulders. So even if Forest Road, 20% of the homes are subject to some of those, those factors? <coughs> so we've got like this, what we call an HHSRS system, which is a, a home housing safety rating system. We're going to use that going forward. We're going to have a workshop on the 25th of November in Upfield. Anybody's welcome to come to that. That's going to have a lot of different people there from different backgrounds, NHS, uh, councils, councillors, parish councils. We're going to use that because we're going to identify properties in Wheelburn using that by sending a questionnaire now finding out who has got issues within their property. It's all data protected so there's, you don't know, it's not going to be like splashed all over the newspapers or whatever. That is what we're using to identify where we can best look at properties that need help in getting them affordably warm. We're working with some of the big utility companies. They're the ones that have got the money. So if we can identify properties that need looking at and actually enhancing to make them affordably warm, we can use their money, why not? They're taking it from us, so let's get it back. I've been nearly, I've been nearly finished now. Yeah. Uh, I'll just finish that one off. So we're working with National Energy Action, they're a comp and, and, and Department of Energy and Climate Change. They're the people that we're working with for this workshop. Um, 25th of November, half past nine, Oakfield Civic Centre. Anybody's welcome to come along if you want to let me know. That's it there. Charles and Dream Pete. Once again, invited to as part of the NEO Warms campaign. I did hear that he's not coming because he's got to be in Parliament that day. The key stakeholders, and we'll all discuss how we can improve. Tackle fuel poverty and look at local referral ideas and how we can get funding opportunities. For Forest Row, I'm working with Anna, and we're going to look at, I'm going to look at a community centre and schools. Um, there are funding streams out there where we can retrofit a school to become like a landmark within a region. There's only 15 sort of like slots for that. I'm hoping to get one for Forest Road to actually get a school retrofit green, so it's totally green, and then that'll be nationally sort of like um, advertised. So there's that. There's community centre funding. There's the Green Deal. There's other things coming on. Hopefully, um, I'll be able to help out on that. Village Hall. Spend some time with you. Village Hall. Another candidate. Village Hall. I mean, places like this are another thing. Well, this is a public hall, but the village hall across the road is over there. Yeah, I mean, I've had a look at that. I've had a look at the roofs on that. So I keep staring at the roofs and saying, "This needs some work doing." Yeah, but yeah. what can you do to it? Because it's a listed building. Yeah. But you can do things to that building. You don't need to say, "Well, 
we can work with planners and say we're not actually changing the actual outlook or the inlook of that building. What we're not, what we're going to change that. We're going to make it look better, but it's going to be a lot warmer when people are in there. Uh, the tallies is the funding. It's a separate charity, just as the building. Yeah, I mean we can work with National Energy Action is a charity. Mm -hmm. Because we can work with them, they can actually access funding in a different life for, for charity, okay. rather than local authorities. So we, we, we've got good leads in there, so we can work with that. Great. Lots of work to do. You showed a graph earlier on that, that effectively directly linked the price of energy <coughs> to the number of people in fuel poverty. Yeah. The measures that you're talking about implementing through funding from whatever source is going to bring that level down. But there must be a point at which, once the price of energy passes, everybody's back into fuel poverty again. Because the measures you make, the measures you make are uh, obviously on the scale of what you just said. But I, I'm an advocate. I'm a personal believer that education is one of the best tools you can use. No, there's, there's a limit. So there is a limit. There will be a limit. There's a limit to the. A, there yeah. will be a limit to everything like yeah. that. Yeah. The more they put the price up, the more the harder we've got to work to get that, that level of fuel poverty down. That is what obviously needs addressing. That, that is why we're having this workshop mm. to get ideas, not from um, politicians, not from people that we hear every day go on about this. You know, they talk about fuel poverty and how they're going to attack that and, and reduce it. We want it from people like yourselves. We want people like who live in, live in this situation to come to that meeting, to come to that workshop, and get their input in there. We, we know we've, we've gone so long now where, you know, like the previous guy said, we do the people do that and talk about it. I'm not. I'm not inclined to think that way. I want something happening, but it has to be the people that actually say it. I don't disagree that all of that stuff should yeah. be happening by any means. Um, I just wonder at what point you have to start turning the camera on the energy companies. Well, they're actually in, in, in talks now. With, I mean, obviously, the, the first thing consultation was to keep the bills at a certain level, but the next one with uh, the, the government and the utilities companies is. You're making that much, that much in profit. You need to now say we're going to peg that that price, and you're not going to change that price for the next ten years. So that is what's that's the consultation going on at this moment in time with energy companies. Unless they play ball, we'll always have that situation. Mm. Fight energy price increase, reduce poverty, goes back up again. Mm. It'll continue to rise. They need to, they need to come to the table and say right, okay, we'll share the wealth and we'll stop this this price rise and we'll keep it at a certain level for so many years. To allow the economy to stabilise and stuff like that. So yeah, I agree with you. But it is going to be hard. Very really difficult. Good. I mean, okay. thanks very much.